Hello dear friends and a warm welcome to another episode of Who's Who in the Bible praying with biblical characters. Today we will explore a character that is not directly found in the sacred scriptures. Veronica. Let's commend this time of reflection and prayer into the hands of our loving Father through Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and all things are created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who illumined the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by that same Spirit to ever seek what is true, to love what is good, and to ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Veronica has captured the imagination of generations of Christians for more than two millennia. The Orthodox Church celebrates her feast on July the 12th and she has found her way to one of the most popular Catholic devotions during Lent, the Stations of the Cross. And yet, it is surprising to note that Veronica is not even once mentioned in the New Testament. Most of the information we have about Veronica comes from an oral tradition which appears in the written form only among the apocryphal writings of the post-apostolic age. In this episode, we will look at whether Veronica is a historical person, why Veronica has captivated the Christian imagination throughout the ages, and what are some enduring lessons that we can learn from her. Let's find out by beginning with a scripture reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. The Gospel of the Lord In this opening passage from the Gospel of St. Luke, we come to know that Luke was aware that there were others trying to compile narratives about Jesus. But he wanted to be orderly and accurate to ensure that the faith was sound. The life and ministry of Jesus Christ is recorded for us by divine providence by four reliable independent witnesses Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels that we know as the canonical Gospels. They are the only accurate, authentic testimony that we have as Christians concerning what Jesus said and did. However, we also know from history that from the earliest times, Christians were aware not only of the external threat of persecutions, but also of the inter internal threat of heretical misrepresentations of the life and teachings of Jesus. We see this awareness in passages like Matthew chapter 25 verses 4 to 6 where Jesus warns of false prophets and in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 4 and Galatians 1, 6 to 8 where St. Paul tries to warn the Christian communities he addresses about false teachers. The early Christians believed, just as we do now, that Christ is alive and his words and actions of the past communicate life and salvation even in the present. But heretical groups often sought to prey upon this faith and the genuine piety of Christians to spread their popular yet false doctrines by naming their writings as Gospels authored by apostles 
or prominent women disciples of Jesus. There were many false gospels that appeared in the early years of the church. This is a fact of history. And these false gospels can be placed into two different categories. First, there were the works that wanted to take the place of the four gospels that had already been authoritative in the Christian community. And the second type of apocryphal texts were those writings which wanted to add to the knowledge of Jesus provided by the canonical gospels. Thus, some of these heretical gospels were attempting to fill in missing information while others were falsely claiming to give the real story about Jesus in contradiction to the apostolic preaching and practice. It is not the latter kind of gospels that Christians ought to be interested in, the ones that give false doctrines, but the former, the ones that try to fill in the gap, so to speak, of the knowledge that we get from the canonical gospels. Because we rejoice at any new information that gives us a fuller and more accurate picture of our Lord Jesus in his humanity and a picture of his closest disciples. While most of the works of Apocrypha are not reliable sources for Christian teaching, they often do give us access to information about Jesus or the apostles that is not available for us in the New Testament which could potentially be accurate. There is, for example, orthodox information that we can get from the Apocrypha. For example, we learn about the ever-virginity of Mary from the Proto-Evangelium of James. We learn about Peter's crucifixion upside down from the Acts of Peter. And we learn about Thomas's visit to India from the Acts of Thomas. Thus we see that while we reject these documents as authoritative for Christian faith, we can learn a lot about the history of the church from their study, even if only to know that heretical groups existed in the past just as they do today. What do we know about this name, Veronica? From where did it emerge? Well, in the 12th century, a theory arose that the name Veronica was derived from the Latin words vera, which means true, and icon, which means image. Another way of saying that Veronica represented the true image of Jesus in her veil. But modern scholars have discovered that Veronica is the Latinized form of the Greek name Bernice or Veronike, which means bearer of victory. Who is Veronica? Biblical scholar Andrea Lorenzo Molinari has made an exhaustive study of the evolution of the sacred legend of Veronica. And I will be depending much on his studies for this episode. Although I said that Veronica is na not named in the Bible, the oral tradition has recognized her in all the three synoptic gospels. How? Where? You may well ask. She is found in Matthew chapter 9, 19 to 22, Mark chapter 5, verses 24 to 34, and Luke 8, 42b to 48. Let me read for you another gospel passage, one among them, the earliest perhaps, Mark chapter 5, verses 24 to 34. And Jesus went with him, and a great crowd followed Jairus and Jesus and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, 
who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. In this passage, dear friends, the woman with the flow of blood remains unnamed. Yet, there is a strong tradition that this woman was named Veronica. Let's see how this is so. According to the scholar Molinari, the earliest reference to Veronica or Veronica comes to us from the 4th or 5th century AD in the apocryphal gospel of Nicodemus, also known as the Acts of Pilate. Let's look at what the Acts of Pilate or the gospel of Nicodemus tells us. This apocryphal gospel claims to give details of Jesus' trial before Pontius Pilate. As the narrative goes, the enemies of Jesus bring three charges against Jesus. That Jesus claims to be the Son of God while they know who his real parents are. That he claims an earthly kingship and that he has healed many people on a Sabbath and thus poses a serious threat to the Jewish law. As the opponents of Jesus try their best to cast slurs on Jesus' character, the story reaches a climax when Jesus' activities as a miracle worker become the center of controversy in the Acts of Pilate. One by one, people step forward out from the crowd to testify to the miraculous actions of Jesus. First in the narrative comes the paralytic who, being healed by Jesus, took up his cot and walked. Second comes a formerly blind man who now sees and cries out to Jesus, Have mercy on me, son of David. Quite clearly referring to Bartimaeus of Mark chapter 10 verses 46 to 52. Then comes another man with a crooked back and uh, another man who is a leper. After these four men comes in a woman named Veronica, our heroine, who cries out in Jesus' defense, and these are her words, I had a flow of blood, and I touched the hem of his garment, and the flow of blood I had for twelve years was stopped. Acts of Pilate, chapter 7. She is immediately discredited by Jesus' enemies who state that the Jewish law does not allow a woman to give witness in court. Therefore, at least by the time of the writing of this text and maybe a little earlier in the oral tradition, Veronica was identified with a biblical character, the woman healed of a hemorrhage by Jesus, which is mentioned in all the three synoptic Gospels. A later 7th century Latin version of the same text, Acts of Pilate, introduced another appendix in which Veronica now in Latin appears again. Different versions of the manuscript tell different versions of this story. But what they all agree upon is that Veronica again is introduced as the woman whom Jesus healed from a hemorrhage. Veronica possesses a miraculous portrait of Jesus now in this version, which she herself had painted out of her gratitude and esteem for Jesus while he was alive. A Roman official in this story comes in search of Veronica because she, he is desperately in need of a cure for a serious illness. Over time and in different geographical regions of the Western world, this story now took on newer versions. In some versions, Veronica was tortured by the official in order to obtain the miraculous image from her. In one particular 8th century version, after handing over the image under torture, she repents and returns to retrieve 
the image from her tormentor who asks her, Woman, whom are you seeking? To which she replies, In truth, I am looking for the image of my Lord that the Lord gave to me, not for my merits, but out of his mercy, and which you have taken away from me against the law, just as the Jews had taken Christ, whom neither you nor your people have seen from the world, even though I have deserved ill, hand back to me, my Lord. For the first time in this version, Veronica identifies the icon with her Lord. She follows the icon and defends it as if she were doing it to the risen Lord himself, using the Lord's words in Luke chapter 23 to 38 and Mark chapter 10 verse 29 to 30. This is the first time when Veronica's relation to the Lord is united to his sayings during his passion. And so, as of now, the legend of Veronica is now tied to the passion of the Lord for the first time. But it is still a portrait made by Veronica, but not an imprint of Jesus' own face. Yet, Veronica says that it is given to her by the Lord. By the 12th century, the image of Jesus was not merely a portrait of Jesus made out of devotion by Veronica, but was an imprint of his face obtained from him while he was alive during one of his pastoral visits to Veronica. Finally, by the 13th century, with the dawn of the Franciscans and their promotion of the Stations of the Cross, Veronica's story was here to stay and strongly cemented to the passion of the Lord with an imprint obtained from the Lord during his passion. Why is Veronica is so important? Quite clearly, Veronica is the name that tradition ascribed to the woman whom Jesus healed from hemorrhage. But the truth about the details of her subsequent following of the Lord are lost in the sands of time. Whether or not Veronica painted a portrait or obtained a direct imprint of the Lord's face, whether it was during his ministry or during his passion, is not clear. It could just be a legend. But what is clear is that the tradition affirms that this healed woman was one of those faithful disciples who was ever grateful to the Lord. We believe that Veronica was one of those courageous women who did not desert the Lord Jesus even in his darkest hour. And that's why Veronica is important. She has found a place in our collective imaginations through the Stations of the Cross to emphasize that while most of us profess like St. Peter did, that we will never desert our Lord in times of difficulty or trial, will we really stick with him like Veronica did? Veronica is an image, a Vera icon, a true image of perfect discipleship. After having experienced healing from the Lord, she is able to bring compassion to the most hateful of situations. Hope and peace when everything around seems to bring despair and consolation in the midst of suffering. What can we learn from the example and the life and legend of Veronica? Well, Veronica was a person who experienced compassion flowing from the garments of Jesus. And so, in the relationship between Veronica and Jesus, we see a beautiful model for gender relations of today. She was a woman who received compassion from the Lord who was a man and returns compassion to the man when he was in his own time of suffering. In our day and age of the constant clash of the sexes, 
is it possible for us to imagine gender relations where we truly look at each other with genuine compassion as fellow human beings, brothers and sisters in Christ? Secondly, Veronica teaches us that people in similar situations as Jesus need people like Veronica to bring consolation and strength in the midst of their unbearable suffering. Let us think about those who suffer with disabilities, terminal illnesses, those who are considered as non-persons in our day and age. Veronica, from her tremendous devotion to the Lord, was so attached to that image of Jesus. And so she becomes the precursor for iconographic spirituality in the church. We have the tradition of the veneration of icons that is so much a part of the Catholic tradition. It is perhaps Veronica who is a part of this tradition of venerating icons as if they were, in a sense, a representation of the presence of the Lord in our midst. Veronica teaches us that even those who are considered as the dregs of society or those who can be discarded, like the elderly so often are, are not really so. The elderly have a lot of lessons for us to learn from. Very often we discard the elderly and we are afraid of our own aging as if it was something that we could ever escape. But the elderly teach us that what is important is not how we look or what we've achieved, but living each moment with meaning. It's far better to live a life of love and giving, even when it is like you're not able to make a difference in society. But the elderly contribute with the wisdom of their experience, their capacity for love and genuine availability to the young. And just as Jesus was ministered to by Veronica, we who perhaps are young are called to minister to the elderly. And the elderly are not just passive recipients of our ministry, but they too have gifts to offer to us with their wisdom, their knowledge, and their faith. The witness of the elderly has important lessons for us to learn. Elderly persons can offer us a reminder that aging and death are not the worst things that can happen to us. The worst thing is not to grow old, but to live a life that is without meaning, goodness and love. A life characterized by closeness or coldness, self centeredness and bitterness. A good life is not one devoted to postponing the effects of aging as long as we possibly can. But good elderly people teach us that a good life is one spent in seeking, in learning, in praising, and in loving God. When the quality of our life is measured in the length of our days, aging is no longer seen as part of a spiritual journey that ends in intimate communion and the vision of God. Rather, it becomes a scientific and technical problem that we must overcome. Age is an enemy to conquer, not another opportunity to love well, to care for others, and to live in friendship with God. We sometimes marginalize the elderly because they remind us of what we resent. That is, that we are finite bodily creatures who live in time and thus cannot escape loss and eventual death. Has our secret desire for perpetual youthfulness turned into an idol that not so secretly hopes that physical immortality might be ours apart from God? And the lives of elderly persons who are at peace with their life testify that life is not a God, but a gift of God, and that it is good, but not the highest good. 
The highest good is found not in physical long life, but in people who transcend themselves in love, kindness, care and compassion for others, like Veronica, and in doing so, grow in the likeness of God. Moreover, elderly persons are providentially situated, as one scholar puts it, to teach us how to grow through losses, failures, and not being defeated by them. My dear brothers and sisters, Veronica is that woman who was healed by the Lord and turned into a true image of Christian discipleship. As we come to the end of this episode, let us remember that no matter how desperate our situation may be, we can be more than conquerors in Christ. As Veronica, in her Greek version of her name, Veronica teaches us that we are bearers of victory in these jars of clay in human lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this image of Veronica ministering to our suffering Saviour has run deep into the imaginations of the Christian world. Help us to learn the lessons that Veronica teaches us and help us to be oases of compassion in this world so marred by war, hatred, violence, prejudice that we may become, like Veronica, oasis of compassion, peace, harmony, love, reaching out to others and bringing healing to one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining in for this episode. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you.